Well, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Helena Moreno, and I'm president of the New Orleans City Council. And it's really my honor to be here with these three uh, amazing gentlemen who are not only authors, but really phenomenal researchers and historians as well. Two of them uh, I've known for quite some time, uh, Doug and, and John, back uh, during my media days when I was a, a news reporter. And both of them, you know, we were here right after Hurricane Katrina and working on that. And then Nathaniel, I've certainly become a big fan of his work and his environmental journalism. But, you know, the, the topic that we are dealing with today is climate change really for Louisiana and the nation. As you all probably are aware that here in New Orleans, we're really in the bullseye of climate impacts. Severe storms and hurricanes are coming at us at a much faster pace and, and they're stronger than we've seen them before and it's giving the people of the city and throughout Louisiana very little time to prepare as well. Billions of dollars have been spent and they're being spent so that we can build up our defenses when it comes to climate change. And we're also seeing from government and, and also from the private sector really high prioritization around climate initiatives. And I'll tell you that even here locally on the New Orleans City Council, we now have a standing committee that is just focused on climate and sustainability. We created that particular standing committee last year. So in the city of, of New Orleans, um, we know that this is such a big issue for us because it really impacts the well-being of our people, our economy, and just to be, you know, just very blunt about it, our overall mere existence. So we're going to delve into to this issue of, of climate in our country and throughout uh, our state with this panel, and let me introduce you to them. So first we have John Barry. Mr. Barry dropped out of graduate school to become a high school football coach. Did you have a winning team? <laughs> well, you, you left out. I coached the 1973 Tulane team. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. Which is, you know. <laughs> they left that part out. So fortunately for all of us, not only did you coach at Tulane, but you also returned to writing, which was your, your big passion. And you uh, went into writing and, of course, into important research topics as well. You are the author of The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history and also Rising Tide, the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and how it changed America. Those works in turn deeply involved Mr. Barry in several areas of public policy, flood protection, water-related disasters, pandemic preparedness, resilience and risk communication, working with state and federal organizations as well as the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Currently, Mr. Barry is a distinguished scholar at Tulane's Bywater Institute, dedicated to comprehensive river research and a professor at the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Nathaniel Rich, welcome. Mr. Rich is an environmental journalist and author of the book, Losing Earth, which focuses on a handful of scientists, politicians, and strategists led by two unlikely heroes who risk their careers in a desperate escalating campaign to convince the world to act before it was too late. Rich tells the human story of climate change and reveals the birth of climate denialism and the genesis of the fossil fuel industry's coordinated effort to thwart climate policy through misinformation, propaganda, and political influence. A resident of New Orleans since 2010, Mr. Rich knows as well as anyone living here in the South or in New Orleans, like myself, the perils of climate change. Mr. Doug Brinkley, in 2006, Brinkley's book, The Great Deluge, Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans, and the Mississippi Gulf Coast, recorded the effects of Hurricane Katrina. In his 2009 publication, The Wilderness Warrior, Theodore Roosevelt, and the Crusade for America, Brinkley showed how the president who shot buffalo in his youth became the president who put aside nearly 240 million acres of wild America and became a key figure in the history of environmentalism and the green movements. In Rightful Heritage, Franklin D. Roosevelt and the Land of America, Brinkley explores our 32nd president's environmental legacy and addresses the fundamental tension between economic growth and environmental stewardship. Brinkley's analysis provides striking parallels to today's political divisiveness on important issues of our time, including climate change and America's stand on the Paris Peace Accord, as well as the roles of the Environmental Protection Agency and FEMA. Mr. Brinkley is Chair of Humanities and Professor of History at Rice University. Let's give him all a round of applause. 
so I will ask each of you questions, but I really want this to be more of, of a conversation. So the first question that I have has to do about really prioritizing uh, the urgency around climate change. And, and the reason why I say that is because what I've found is that you know, people in their daily lives are very much aware of what's happening right in front of them, and that's what consumes them. So uh, what's happening in their daily lives and what's happening in their communities from, you know, uh, rising costs of gas and rising bills and crime and infrastructure of streets and a pandemic. So how do we properly message that this is such an urgent matter that requires consistent work at and not just something that becomes a topic of discussion after there's a major climate event or, or storm that passes. And Nathaniel, I'll go ahead and start with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, thank you. It's it's a thrill to be here with all of you um, and with Council Member Mor Council President Moreno. Um, you didn't mention that I, you also knew me from. Um, incessant uh, constituent letters about <laughs> <coughs> mainly about Entergy. Um, yes, he is my constituent. As yes. Well. Um, <laughs> thank you. But uh, yeah, this is. I mean, it's it's tricky because I think there's there's two conversations um, that are are parallel. I mean, one is the activist conversation, which is the one that you're talking about, which is basically how do you get the word out? How do you convince people to act? Um, I think one thing that living in Southern Louisiana that's somewhat refreshing about it, and, and this is sort of, I think, true nationally as you go down the hierarchy politically, um, is that people in Southern Louisiana, even if they're on the right, uh, are a lot more willing to recognize climate change as an issue. I mean, if you go down to Plaquemines Parish, where <clears throat> I wrote a story that's um, my last book, you know, people there uh, are not in denial about climate, but what, what does come up over and over again is, you know, as you said, what's you know what's in it for me? If, if we're going to advance major policies and kind of necessary policies uh, that we need to to survive in this in this part of the world or really anywhere, um, you know, how can you do it in such a way that it's not painful or you know punitive to right. those folks? And so I think it, in some ways a more sort of more interesting and more urgent conversation is. Um, can we get past the point of, of, you know, just trying to convince people that climate change is real, and can we get into the more difficult, um, necessary conversations about, you know, what are the trade-offs that we're looking at? What are what is what are the best and worst case scenarios? Um, if you want to live, if you want to live in Plaquemines Parish or New Orleans, um, in the future, you know, what things have to change? Mm -hmm. And I feel like because so much of the energy has been focused on just the sort of crass. Um, you know, is, is, the, is the world warming up uh, at that level of the conversation? We haven't gotten into the more nuanced, challenging, but ultimately, you know, necessary conversations about, well, things are going to tra transform dramatically. How can we do so in a way that's consistent um, with the best of our, our values? And, and Doug, really, in your research, you've, you've focused on uh, what Nathaniel uh, touched on here about just the divisiveness over this issue to begin with. It's always divisive, conservation versus development, uh, environmentalism, you know, um, versus the new post-World War II technical, um, you know, military order. It's always clashing. Uh, Nathaniel touched on a big one, the regional concerns. When it's your backyard that's flooding or your uh, redwood forest that's burning and or your child's getting sick from dirty air, you suddenly become an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. I've been writing a book will be out in November called Silent Spring Revolution on Kennedy, Rachel Carson, Johnson, but I'm looking at the 60s environmental movement with an eye of how can we do that 60s environmental movement for the climate change mm. movement? What can I learn from how they did things? My journey forced me to go back to the Trinity bomb, the atomic bomb, because then willy-nilly after World War II, we started then blowing up the Nevada desert, radiation fields, I mean, just poisoning the planet with atomic bombs blowing in. You know, we have people like Dr. Barry Commoner who started doing studying baby teeth and starting to um, say people are getting sick from fallout. So that was a big, and it's still there. Look right now at Ukraine today, right? We're looking at those nuclear plants. God forbid yeah. something happens. Uh, and out of that, I've picked up that, that Rachel Carson was a big deal in 1962 when she wrote Silent Spring because Carson was telling everybody in the audience, 
Your kid can be sick. Your kid be sick. That pesticides in the backyard, you think your kid's playing, but they could be getting poison. That there was a healthy wilderness lobby of saving roadless wilderness. There was efforts to save new national parks and all of that, a TR kind of conservation. But Rachel Carson was like, boom. And, you know, at that point, it, it, things started speeding up to suing. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund in 1967's slogan was, sue the bastards. <laughs> and that you win by lawsuits. And it was unique that a Supreme Court Justice, William O. Douglas, one of the great environmentalists, used his Supreme Court office as a clearinghouse for the Sierra Club and the Wilderness Society and Audubon and all the groups of that era. And, and then the big thing is presidential leadership. Uh, yes, TR and FDR. They were, uh, the FDR would write on his, op what is your job? He'd write Forrester. He ran a forest plant, tree plantation. T.R. wrote books about the wilderness and all. Kennedy did, what I, you can make a stretch argument that the ocean was his wilderness. He loved yachting, but it was with the cigar and, you know, the, and, uh, and, but yet he never didn't sign environmental legislation and got it passed. Um, and so Kennedy saved Padre Island or Point Reyes in California or on national seashores, Cape Cod. And he started environmentalism getting big. It was proto-environmental. But it started, he embraced Rachel Carson's research by appointing scientists to say, yes, DDT is, is, is problematic. And, the, as for, and, and then there became, by the, the thing I'm having right about, how did, what the, for, how did we get Clean Air Quality Act uh, in, uh, in 1967 or the Clean Air Act of 1970, Clean Water Act of 72? Nixon creates the EPA. Nixon creates the Environmental Protection Agency. He did not care about those issues. The public right, right, demanded right. it after Rachel Carson and then the Santa Barbara oil spill mm -hmm. and, and the Cuyahoga River on fire. I think missing in the climate debate, media has to put it front and center. Yes. You've got to put it on the nightly news. Walter Cronkite made sure every half an hour had a, an environmental story starting in 70, in color, dead rivers. The, and now you see, uh, well, well, yeah, we'll deal with climate. We're not sure it's a climate crisis. Yeah. It doesn't get the attention, and we've got to demand the media puts it first and foremost in support environmental journalists at every newspaper and organization in the country. Last thing on climate, we knew about it. Kennedy knew about the climate challenge is, er, during his presidency with Roger Revelle. Lyndon Johnson gave a speech about climate change as president. I've read a, the great memo Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote Nixon suggesting after his research, Moynihan said Miami and New York could be underwater in the Nixon years. So climate has been there. And Barack Obama, to his everlasting credit, did everything he could to ring the client, to turn it into the movement, but he couldn't quite pull it off. And then Trump took it in a downward direction as a national issue. You saw Biden trying to elevate it, but he's been stumbling, part folding it into the Build Back Better Act. So hence, without, TR said, conservation's the number one issue of natural resource, number one. You need a president that's gonna say, climate is the number one issue. And Obama tried, couldn't quite pull it off, and now we still need presidential leadership and the media to join with all these great grassroots groups that are all over the country now, and the young people are ready for the climate change revolution. You know, Doug, but you were talking about how Carson was able to uh, pinpoint during uh, the movement that you spoke of, of children getting sick. And you know, this is something that John has actually looked at when it comes to how climate has an impact on disease and even possible pandemics. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, first, <laughs> And you didn't have quite as organized. I'm mean, actually, for me to pontificate on this when you're writing a book on it is ridiculous. <laughs> you know more about it than I. But my sense was that the oil industry, for example, wasn't as organized. And when that first came out in the, in the 60s, they've been obviously highly organized ever since. You know, the denying climate change. You know, today. 
everybody is, as you said, fire is on the west. We certainly know about floods here. Uh, there is still difficulty moving things through the Congress. The legislative process, or for that matter, the Louisiana State Legislature, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't penetrate. I think there's partly because, if not entirely, because of the politicization, the polarization, not just politicization of everything. It's a, similar to pandemics. I think this kind of, uh, you know, Biden had a $22 billion plan. Uh, the House cut it to $15 billion and then dropped it out entirely. And we're talking about today. You know, initially I thought pandemic funding would, would be safe for a few years. Now, in terms of climate change and, and disease, yeah, it, it is a factor in future pandemics, and development is a f factor in future pandemics. The more that uh, humans encroach upon the wild, uh, the more exposure you have to pathogens that normally don't intersect with a person, don't have an opportunity uh, to jump species. Um, in addition, you have obviously the warming climate, you know, affects all the vector borne diseases uh, and makes them more likely to spread and makes it easier for mosquitoes to breed. Uh, some pathogens do better in warm temperatures, some don't. Uh, you know, the mosquitoes can spread through uh, more northern areas other vectors, Lyme disease, everything, you know, they, there is a relationship uh, there. Uh, anyway, I'll cut. And I, I do want to recognize Rich Campanella in the audience there, who probably knows. Where is, where is Rich? Hi, uh, there, there you there. are. Hey. Certainly in terms of uh, our, our local situation, knows as much as anybody uh, as to what we're facing. Mm -hmm. um, I will say I don't think Plaquemine Parish is going to exist in 50 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, no matter what we do, you know, we have a $50 billion master plan, the real cost of which is in excess of $100 billion. The funding for that plan, it, it's going to run out as, as soon as the BP spill money runs out. Uh, where, that, where that money is going to come from, I mean, we're locally in, in a very difficult situation here. And, you know, John, myself being a former member of, of the media, I can tell you that the two of the issues that you just talked about should be major media stories. One, of, the, of, of climate really impacting disease, and two, the fact that there is a, an area that everyone in Louisiana is aware of, Plaquemine, that may no longer uh, be here. And, and uh, you know, I know that Gordon Russell's here. I hate to put anybody on the spot, but Gordon, those are, those are you know, really fantastic stories that I think we'd love to see the advocate put on the front page. And, uh, you know, we've seen... <laughs> Just a hint, um, <laughs> you know, um, and and I'll say this, you know, I I think that as a policymaker, it's also been um, difficult to uh, really get media attention around some things that we've done locally or even that are happening on the state level. For for example, a renewable clean portfolio standard. New Orleans passed that. Um, you know, a few months ago, we started the process two years ago because we regulate our power utility. But sometimes I wonder if. If it, if, if it, is it, does it get too technical? Is it too in the weeds that maybe it, it gets harder to understand and maybe that's why we're not getting the type of media attention around some of these initiatives that are happening? You're in the media too, Doug. I'll, I'll, All right. I'll have well, you answer I'll take that. that. Um, look, we're, you know, uh, gas companies buy TV ads and they give, give jobs and a lot of people don't want to see shutdowns of oil and gas and getting rid of fossil fuels. John touched on something very important um, that that 60s environmental movement, we call it the long 60s, it ended in 1973. Nixon did not give a damn about it. In fact, when he created the EPA, the original R R Ruckel's House document, which Ruckel's House wrote, is the first head of the EPA, and he wrote the founding document at the Nixon Library, it's all this um, beautiful prose by Ruckel's house about the natural world and, and then some great legal language, and a nice document. I went, Nixon's got his original, and he wrote in ballpoint pen by all of Ruckel House's comments, bullshit. <laughs> Seriously, a president of the United States, he was not an environmentalist, Richard Nixon, when he signed all this, 
But Nixon, because he signed it all, lost the conservative movement. They dumped him during Watergate. And the big document to look up on your phone when you leave is the Lewis Powell document of 1971, which Bill Moyers teaches people to hone in on. That's when oil and gas lobbies solidified. That's when um, Powell was head of the tobacco industry and said, this is going to be an attack on capitalism, environmentalism. They're going to shut down, once endangered species went, they're going to shut down every development known to humankind. And the counterattack against environmentalism has broad reaches. It created the Cato Institute and the uh, American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation and alternative media, which led to the Fox News talk radio. And, and it's all a war against environmentalism. It's the key war. If you turn on Fox tonight, it'll be Biden on energy, and he's not opening the Keystone Pipeline. And this is a war going on between two sides, and the the movement on climate change isn't quite winning. We've stoked consciousness. We're having panels like this. We're getting close, mm -hmm. but how many more cataclysmic events do we need to experience till we make this America's number one priority? Well, but Doug, don't you, oh, let me just uh, say, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. I was, while we're here, the Tulane uh, Environmental Law so they have an annual meeting on environmental law. That's going on right now uh, in the law school, though most of it is, is virtual. Uh, you know, I think Congress has demonstrated an inability to act. Uh, I think the judicial process is really uh, the best way that you will see action. However, you know, judges have a lot of impact on that. You know, Nathaniel wrote a great piece in the New York Times Magazine, which became a movie, uh, about a long, drawn-out fight. You know, a lot of the audience knows about the lawsuit I was responsible for filing against the industry when I was on the levy board over coastal land loss. You know, our, our lawsuit was dismissed, uh, said we had no standing to file, I, you know, whatever however ridiculous I thought the ruling was, parishes had, do have explicit standing in the law. They filed, uh, six or seven parishes filed. None of those suits have come to trial. The oil industry keeps sending them for different reasons, claiming it should be in federal courts. All these things take time. They're great delayers. Uh, but eventually, I think that's the, the route that is going to yield something. Uh, I don't think there are many climate change deniers anymore. Mm -hmm. There are some, but yeah. I think the overwhelming majority of the public is a believer. What about, and, and Nathaniel, take this one, what about the impact of, of corporate America? It seems that they are moving uh, in the direction of, of working to support climate policies. And what impact does that have? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you have to be really skeptical of any you know, <clears throat> claims by corporations saying that their 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 care is for the environment and not for their uh, profits. Yeah, it would be in violation of their I think you know, you know charter my experience to their tax on that. Yeah, to mm -hmm. their uh, shareholders. Um, I, there's so much that was discussed that I want to talk about, so I'm trying to to focus. But I mean, I think I mean what I what I wrote about in Losing Earth was this period of time in the '80s uh, when there was a whole other you know, as Doug said, there's. Uh, Obviously, this has become poison, political poison now, talking about climate change. But in the 80s, there was this kind of Republican that doesn't exist anymore, that at least, and I'm excited to read your book to learn to follow that, that uh, trend. Obviously, Nixon didn't care. Um, but there was a whole old form of conservative um, that espoused environmental you know, values. There was a, a conservative plea for uh, protection of global warming that, you know, there was one issued at the beginning of the Reagan administration by the head of his Council on Environmental Quality. Um, that part of the party, um, we can argue about how effective it was or, or would have been, but that's completely gone. Um, but I, I do think as an interesting counter narrative or, or uh, proposal, and I'm, since John is basically the he should be talking about this more more than I should, um, and in fact, I've written about John and this this whole lawsuit. But but the, the what's going on now in Southern Louisiana, this 50-year master plan, 
I feel like it's safe to say, feel free to contradict me, is the world's biggest climate mitigation infrastructure plan. Yeah. I and so say. look, like we're here in Southern Louisiana, um, and this always drives me crazy, you're talking about media coverage. I don't think most people know that this is the site of this, uh, basically the, the globally the most um, uh, ambitious climate master plan, it's a uh, climate infrastructure plan. And it's an interesting plan because it's, um, it's honest about what it can do and what it can't do. Um, it, it admits that it can't save the coast entirely. If anything, um, the latest statements are that, you know, we're just trying to buy time for people to move out safely before it's too late. Um, and this was passed in an all red state. It's almost unanimous support. Where there's not support, uh, increasingly, is Plaquemines Parish, because there's so many concerns about the diversion of the Mississippi River, which will be used to build up marsh and how that will destroy the fisheries down there. Um, and yet, no one ever uses the word climate change when talking mm -hmm. about it. And so it's, it seems like yeah. one of those simple tricks. Like you, you, yeah. you but yeah. but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, even Bell Edward, John Bell Edward, coastal doesn't restoration. Talk about, yes, mm -hmm. restoration. It's the jobs. Mm -hmm. It's economy, mm -hmm. um, and so on. And so I think that's the future of where we're going. I, I think the the political language around climate change is is cliched at this point. It's dead. It's 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 poisonous. Um, you're not going to get uh, a national Republican saying that climate change is the most important you know, thing. That's just not going to happen in anyone's lifetime. Um, but you might get a 50-year master plan that's yeah. actually as ambitious as, as, as the problem demands. Um, but I think it also require a lot more honesty about, you know, we're, not, we're, we're past the point in the history uh, where we're going to fix the problem. I mean, I, in Losing Earth, I wrote about uh, the 80s. In 1979, people were saying, and Friends of the Earth, mm -hmm. we have 10 years to fix this problem. Like, does that sound familiar? People are still saying that. Um, of course, we failed, and the problem changes. Now the problem is, um, can we survive on this planet? Then it was, can things stay the way they are? Mm -hmm. So we've, we've lost that, that one, but we're still um, in the middle of this battle, and I think the language needs to shift, yeah. but also the, st and the kinds of stories that we tell about it need to shift as well. You, know, you make such a good point, because after Hurricane Ida that we had hit uh, New Orleans and other parts of, of Louisiana, the Public Service Commission, and along with the New Orleans City Council, but the, 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 we started talking about, you know, uh, the council here in New Orleans started talking about how do we how do we address uh, uh, climate problems, particularly when it comes to uh, the power grid that we have in New Orleans. When you would hear the PSC talking about it, it's about um, uh, hardening our grid. There you go. There was no yeah. there was no conversation, at least at that level, about climate. Yeah. Here in New Orleans, sure, we'll talk about climate all day long, but, um, but at the, at the, that you made a really good point, and I didn't realize that until you, until you just mentioned that. And so, as we talk about infrastructure, how do we ensure, and we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, it, hopefully that there would be this major transformation nationwide when we're talking about um, climate sustainability infrastructure. How do we ensure that there's equitable re distribution of resources, that uh, cities that may not be as affluent as others, that, that, that they're not forgotten? Um, Any one of y'all can take it. John, no, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, I once went to a Aspen Institute climate session like this had all Tom, Ted Turner was in good form and he was there, Jimmy Carter and all that. But I saw the young people and people that were clustering there in Aspen, and at that very moment, Mark Udall was running for the U.S. Senate, and Mark Udall was one of the big voices on issues of the environment and climate, and he lost. And yet, you got to go door to door for people that are going to take climate issues seriously. It is polarized. I mean, but if we're not going to have politicians that, if we're going to stay divided like we are now, I think he nailed it. It's going to have to use new language. When I go around America to groups, and to, if I use the word environment, I'm seen as a tree hugger. <laughs> and then if I use climate change now, I'm, they, they'll walk out. <laughs> okay? So the language is lost on those terms. If I go to where I grew up around Toledo, Ohio, and say, hey, we've got to save the Maumee River with fish and have clean water, and we've got to be able to clean up our beaches and, and, and get rid of the toxicity of Lake Erie, I'll get a standing ovation because mm -hmm. I didn't use climate change and environment, which are seen as liberal, left-wing, groupthink talking points. 
And, and Nathaniel rightfully marked, I don't know the exact area, but you know, George Herbert Walker Bush, I would call an environmentalist with clean air. And he and, ran to the left of Dukakis. Yeah. And his aunt, he said, I'm, you know, gonna, I'm gonna be the greenhouse uh, president. So that's as late as the 90s with them, but things changed as we all know. And I don't, John, I don't know. I do think the Trump world has a lot of climate deniers yeah. that are, and they're powerful and they're out there on the internet. Now they may not fully deny it, but their bit thing is, so what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, certainly there are still deniers, but you know, with the weather events for the past few years, you know, in their hearts, they know. Uh, the whole Trump, you know, identify, you know, it's become cultural and I, and I don't want to go off on pandemics and stuff like that. You know, a lot of the disinformation is actually, you know, that's part of Russia plan. I, I'll tell you an interesting anecdote that, you know, I had, I'm involved with somebody who follows this stuff very closely. There was a lot of Twitter and social media uh, support for the uh, truckers in, in Canada until shortly before Russia invaded when all of that noise, it didn't just decline, it disappeared 100%. That was actually Russian disinformation hmm. on an issue like that. I think it's just, similarly, you know, that's involved with uh, some of the climate deniers. Uh, that may sound paranoid, but I think it's a demonstrable fact if you actually track some of that stuff down. So if people want to start lining up to ask questions, please come to the microphone in the middle. While you line up, let me ask uh, Nathaniel this question because you and I had emailed about this. As we, as we work toward this transformation um, to deal with climate impacts, how do we ensure that, for example, a, a city like New Orleans, that it keeps its aesthetic and also it, its culture? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I mean, I think this, the culture of New Orleans um, was forged out of disaster and mm -hmm. out of resistance to disaster. I mean, this is a city that long before global warming uh, was understood um, faced existential crises seemingly every few years um, yes, I from know. its founding. <laughs> uh, but, you know, fires burning down the whole city, every single plague and, you know, that, that ever passed through the continent seemed to start here. Um, and flooding and all the rest of it. And, and I think... Uh, and you didn't even touch on the past couple of years. No, I'm not even getting into the 20th century. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so this is a city that, uh, yeah, not to mention slavery and all, disaster in New Orleans around that. And so, you know, this is a city that has forged its identity out of, uh, you know, surviving and coping with these disasters. And, and as a result, I think a lot of the best things about this place um, come from the fact that uh, forever uh, New Orleanians have been looking honestly at uh, the precariousness of the situation. And there's something I find really refreshing about that. You know, there's no one in denial here uh, who lives here um, about the possibility of, of hurricanes and climate change and all the rest. Um, and yet we choose to live here in spite of that. And I think that's um, one of the things that distinguishes this place from anywhere else is that there's um, you know, so much of the culture, I think, flows out of that, um, that decisiveness and, and, and fearlessness and, mm -hmm. and, and honesty about risk um, in, in our lives. And that we just love the city. Yeah. Yeah, for all those <laughs> for reasons. For all those reasons. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Go ahead, sir. Is this mic on? It's on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my background is in an engineering area called petrophysics. And, and my question is about what's the best path forward to the future? And, and uh, I think most would acknowledge we can't make much progress by 2030, but let's say we honestly want to get off fossil fuels by 2050 or 2060, you name the date. How do we get there? We, we cannot get there with wind and solar, I think most would acknowledge. I haven't heard the panel even address the issue of how do we really get off fossil fuels? We need a lot of research, we need a lot of new technology, a lot of improved technology, but I'd like to hear the, the experts here address that. That's really Nathaniel's looking to Yeah, I mean, Nathaniel. there's, I, I, this, I'm not an expert in energy, you know, I'm not an energy journalist, but there's, 
there are all these pathways. James Hansen, who I wrote about, is probably the most prominent climate scientist, has one. There are these 10-year pathways that get us not necessarily to zero carbon, but get us to where we're going to protect against more than two degree warming. And essentially, what all of these, I think there's something like 100 different versions of this out there, but basically it means stop incentivizing oil and gas production and consumption, um, give more money to renewable energy, um, a big, uh, you know, a big question mark and, and subject to debate is nuclear energy. That's that divides, you know, the environmentalists. Mm -hmm. There's also then a bunch of boring things that are, you know, retrofitting buildings. Um, agriculture is one of the biggest carbon, most carbon intensive industries in the world. There's so there's a lot of practices that can be reformed in a in such a way that in you know the IPCC. Um, you can go on their website and read all the different versions of this. So it's, that stuff is not uh, mysterious. There's, that's been well planned out. And the question is, how do you incentivize that? How do you move money towards pursuing those policies? Yeah, and then the scariest thing is geoengineering. Uh, mm -hmm. People want to, you know, shoot uh, stuff to block out. Uh, you know, it's it's a little scary. You know, you can read. You know. Technically, it sounds actually feasible that they could do this. Uh, it's the unintended consequences that are, are pretty potentially scary. Yeah, I mean, we're increasingly at the place, though, where we have unintended consequences mm -hmm. of warming the world beyond two degrees versus, um, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, frankly, I think we may end up coming to something like that in, in 20 years when things get begin to get re really bad and it's really obvious to everyone and that would be a last ditch kind of attempt. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen. You know, I, during the um, Cold War period, John F. Kennedy was able to do his moonshot um, with government, you know, he galvanized right and left. We're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. There's a need for an earth shot now, but Kennedy got Republicans on board. I don't know on this issue how you, the politics work. So I think it's probably going to be back, left to the private sector to come up with new types of technology that are affordable, that people will be able to, um, you know, trust. Right now, the electric cars are very expensive. Um, um, people are worried about distances on them. Old habits about getting gasoline are very real. So there, there's, I can envision the world of my children or uh, might be all fossil fuels maybe, but I don't see it coming anytime soon um, because the, without the government leadership of an earth shot and both parties pulling together on it. And then how do you bring China into the story and India? And uh, it's just a mess right now. So they're probably the salvation will be in private sector innovation. I think it's going to take a lot more than just making oil and gas expensive. We, we people, the skepticism is largely based on people are worried they won't be able to afford this new. World. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yep. Thank you. Come on up, ma'am. Honestly, taking into account the polarization here uh, and in all the first world and what's the reluctance in the third world, is it too late? Are we honestly past the point where we can save New Orleans, save the planet? Uh, do we have to look at what we're doing as more theater than useful now? I think that's a very good question. <laughs> and. On the one hand, I'm really pessimistic. I'm, the only thing that sort of keeps me going, uh, you, you may be familiar with the saying, all models are wrong, some are useful. Uh, I think that if uh, the models are, our best chance is that the models are wrong. Uh, I think that they're right <laughs> and they're useful, but I already said I think Plaquemines gone. I don't, uh, New Orleans may be gone. Uh, so I'm like you, you know, fairly pessimistic. I, I, I'm a per 
I'm a professor at Rice, so I have young people, and you don't. I have to keep them positive, right? I think Bill McKibben has done an amazing job of teaching young people to at least stay positive that we can make a mm -hmm. difference, you can change. Now, the thing is, it's not just that issue, it's how do we become stewards of planet Earth? How do we protect our, our limited resources so you can get some wins on local levels here and there? But the real me is what John's, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic that we're at the point of no return, but I don't want to not have those young people get engaged because it might have spill-off effect of saving a bayou or cleaning this or creating new wildlife corridors so wildlife can move from one place to another. And so you need their interest in believing that they can make a difference. And if you're just marketeering pessimism, it's going to be very, um, very hard to even begin the, to um, make some small saves here and there. I would just briefly make a different point. I mean, I think that there's been some of the bankruptcy around the language about climate change, which I think is fueled by the climate denialism, is to to make it into this uh, black and white thing, a binary thing. Are we doomed or are we going to be gloriously successful? Um, obviously, there's a huge range, and this is one of the problems of talking about climate change, there's a huge range of outcomes still available to us. The longer we wait, the range keeps shifting you know, negatively uh, in the wrong direction. But look, there's the IPCC report, you know, it's all triggered to two degrees Celsius. Well, there's a huge difference between two degrees Celsius and 2.1 degrees Celsius. There's a huge difference between 2.1 and 2.2, on and on. And so I don't, I think even talking about it in those terms as like success or failure is a form of self-delusion that we're, you know, human beings will survive. It's what's the, what is the world going to look like and what is civilization going to look like in the future? And that over that question, we still can exert an enormous amount of control while acknowledging that things are still, we're past the point of going back to, you know, 1980. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Claudia Dreyfus. I teach at Columbia University in the sustainability program. And to some of the questions that you all have been raising, but particularly Douglas Sprinkler, the last, this is sincerely meant, but the last two years and maybe the last five or six have been so astonishing to me and others about what our fellow Americans are about. So bewildering when you have 800,000 deaths from COVID and yet large sectors of our federal, of our fellow citizens don't even believe it's going on. How are you gonna convince people and develop that constituency that you're talking about that could do something when such a big portion of our Fellow citizens are in some other world. I agree, and I in completely with that. And I do feel it might be me being spiritual, but I do think uh, I was looking at Dr. Albert Schweitzer and the reverence for life. The fact that we have to take care of this planet, and we've got to. We how could you not? And so your the hope might be in the churches, uh, and in synagogues, religious movement of protecting and saving the planet. But for young people. They're getting, they're like climbing and they don't know what to do. So sometimes you just say, look, adopt a national park. Be friends of a species in peril. Uh, small things, if a lot of people do and make a little bit of difference, but on the bigger question you're telling, I don't know where that, this, this, we're in a neo-civil war right now in this country and it's not going, it's not helpful to create the earth shot mm -hmm. I'm talking about until at least we can get half of the Republican Party on board, and maybe maybe that will happen. History's full of surprises, um, but uh, I appreciate your comment um, greatly. Without the, the Trump has done damage to this country in a very real and significant way, and I see him as a climate denier. He was his president. He wasted time not educating us about it, and we're, we're in a hole right now due to having to do with the pandemic and global affairs and failures and talks. And I see climate sinking as an issue. Maybe uh, uh, one quick thing, James A. Baker III, Secretary of the State, lives in Houston, a friend of mine. I was trying to help create a, a, a national Galveston Bay National Recreation Area modeled after the San Francisco National Recreation. He said the word, are you kidding me? Don't even mention San Francisco here in Texas. <laughs> You're not gonna get one person and you better tell them how they're gonna make money 
uh, on this recreation area. And for God's sake, turn the name, call it the Lone Star State National <laughs> Recreation right, Area. Right, right, right. And, right. you know, it, but anyway, it's that messaging. And maybe the word restoration that Nathaniel mentioned, maybe instead of climate change, has right. to be about American restoration. Mm -hmm. uh, because maybe climate change is, is now a term that isn't going to be able to make that create a unified front down the line. All right, well, uh, I'm out of time. We're out of time. I'm sorry they can't take your questions, but they will be, you'll be signing your books?